let's pretend, okay, that this is not a panel discussion tonight. Let's pretend that this is the Red May City Council that's considering its business. Now, for a president of the Red May City Council, I have a candidate who I think would be perfect because he is about to be elected to the city council itself and will get some practice of being president of that. So let me first uh, invite up our president for tonight, Sean Scott, active organizer, filmmaker, writer, uh, uh, millennials. Give me, the, give me the title again. I can't see it in, with the small print. I have your book. And I, it's millennials and they're mo millennials. <laughs> what, what is it, man? All right. <laughs> All right, President of City Council. So, Sean, since this is going to be about housing and cities in the future, maybe you have some ideas of policies that you can enact or we could change from what's being done now. Yeah, sure do. Um, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for making it out tonight. Um, the theme of our campaign and my campaign for city council to capture uh, the District 4 seat on the Seattle City Council for Democratic Socialist Leadership is that we have a right to the city. You don't have to make a lot of money or have a lot of money stored up in your house as far as home equity to have a right to be in Seattle. Um, we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years really the recession of government's responsibility to provide housing as a human right to uh, Seattleites and to people in cities like Seattle. And so we think we need to change that. We need to change that by taxing the rich to pay for more social housing, number one. Um, we need to change that by changing our zoning codes to make it so that um, areas throughout the city are actually able to absorb the growth that we're going to need to be an actually inclusive city. Um, and we need to change that by making Seattle generally just a more dense, more walkable place where people are not leading car-centric lifestyles and paying for that with massive public investment um, in the form of taxing the rich to build the kind of city that we need. So All right, I think that's good. Good. great. Yeah. So will you take the presidential seat in the center of the council there? Well, these seats all look the same. Which one's the presidential one? I think it would be one of the inner seats in the inner sanctum of the council. And let's get our other council members up now. From Drexel University, author of uh, Mobility Justice, Mimi Scheller. <laughs> and coming from Chicago, uh, so, Illinois, what is it, Chicago? Tell me the university, Cedric. <laughs> university of Illinois at Chicago. Cedric is the author of From Re Cedric Johnson is the author of From Revolutionaries to Race Leaders, and uh, the neoliberal deluge, Hurricane Katrina, and the remaking of New Orleans. And last, uh, from uh, City University of New York, Samuel Bruce Stein, who is the author of Capital City. Gentrification and the real estate state. Now, I want to imagine—I want you to imagine all of you, members of the council, that you have been dispatched on a mission to investigate housing displacement around the world, and you're coming back to report to the president of the council. Uh, and you'll each give your reports in turn. Maybe we'll start with Cedric's report, then go to Mimi's, and have Sam's the last. Okay, the council is now in session. All right, good evening. Is this on? Yeah. Good evening. Um, in keeping with the town hall format, I didn't know if I was giving a report from uh, Chicago or should I give a report from New Orleans, and so I was still thinking about it as I was standing over in the corner. So what I'll do is I'll actually give a report from New Orleans as a cautionary tale for the kinds of problems we're seeing in terms of uh, rent intensification uh, across the country right now. Um, Adolph Reed, the political scientist at the University of Pennsylvania, who just retired actually, I think, after this semester, made the point during the Katrina crisis uh, in a series of articles that Katrina actually was um, a representation of the problems that all Americans could possibly face. It was just in the most compressed and condensed and dramatic form, right? And I think my comments are sort of based on that particular uh, notion. And so I want to riff on that. I also want to try to dispel some of the ideas about what happened in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. The dominant frame, of course, was the one that was largely uh, shaped by media, right, by mass media, and what we saw unfolding on television, which was true, right? We saw mostly um, black people stranded at the New Orleans Superdome. We saw black people 
waiting outside the Morial Convention Center uh, for help, for assistance. We saw people scribbling uh, help signs on bed sheets, writing out messages on the tops of, of houses, demanding that somebody respond to the conditions in New Orleans. We also heard um, then Mayor uh, Ray Nagin go online and basically, you know, stop just short of cursing out George Bush uh, for not responding. We also saw Kanye West, maybe in one of his best moments, um, <laughs> even though it was limited as far as what he said, uh, call out Bush as well and call out the problem of racism as it related to what was unfolding in New Orleans. The, the, the response that I remember hearing a lot from people was this would never happen in Manhattan, like if lower Manhattan flooded in this way, it wouldn't happen in other places, you would see a much quicker response. And so I'm not gonna try to refute that. I think Bush didn't care about um, black people, he certainly doesn't care about um, people who are not part of the same uh, investor class that, he's, that he belongs to. But I wanna dispel some of that, because what we've seen in New Orleans over the last um, decade or so, since the, the, um, the, the disaster, is a dramatic remaking. And what I want to insist on is that racism only tells us part of the story, right? No matter how we decide to talk about it, whether it's institutional racism, whether it's some sort of uh, structural account, white supremacy, which seems to be the term du jour for a lot of people. When I was a, a teenager in the 20-something, the only people who talked about white supremacy were like Afrocentrists and people who were kind of on the margins even of black political life. So it's interesting to see academics now embrace that term for a variety of reasons um, I, that I won't go into. But let's talk about New Orleans and what happened. When we think about the remaking, I want you to think about it as a problem of class power and exactly, uh, building on Reed again, um, one point that he also makes about neoliberalization or neoliberalism, what is it? It's basically capitalism without working class opposition. There's a lot of ways we can, we can talk about it as a process, we can talk about the specifics of it on the ground, we can talk about the, the processes of roll, roll back and roll out um, and so we can, we can discuss that and kind of get into the finer points. But in the broad sense, it is a struggle for the restoration of capitalist class power, particularly within the city. And I like the term that was coined by the late geographer Neil Smith when he talks about um, you know, urban revanchism. This is about revenge. It is about the taking back of the city by the investor class, by upperly mobile people who now want to live in cities again after a long uh, period of decline and neglect. In New Orleans, what we saw was, was tragic in the short run. I mean, what we saw on television was, was heart-wrenching. But a lot of people turned off their, their attention, you know, once the, the news decided to start focusing on something else. And so within a few weeks, people weren't paying attention to New Orleans anymore. Maybe they would return to it every anniversary and, you know, point to some things that had happened and that were, you know, doing well. The French Quarter's back up and running. You can go get a hurricane, enjoy yourself, you know, get sloppy drunk or whatever else, but the real story, the slow-moving, um, multi-layered catastrophe of the remaking, most people have missed, right? Most people have not paid attention to it. Uh, what I would recommend, if you haven't seen it already, is um, Luisa Dantas, the uh, Brazilian-born filmmaker who also resides in uh, New Orleans now. She grew up between Rio and New York. I can't think of a better split to have uh, as far as growing up. Um, but she did a film called Land of Opportunity, which is excellent, because it actually shows you the situated class experiences of different New Orleanians in the remaking. So you meet middle class um, black homeowners, you meet public housing residents, you meet uh, community activists, you meet a, a displaced teenager who's now living in Los Angeles, right? So you get a sense of what this looked like on the ground for multiple people. You also um, get a sense of what it meant for um, migrant laborers, and in this case, not Mexican undocumented laborers, but undocumented Brazilian workers who were also in the region doing some of the cleanup and, and recovery work. I've had a long running conversation with the um, sociologist Jay Arena. There's one thing that we really share that pisses us the fuck off every time we think about it about New Orleans. And that's the fact that thousands of people descended upon Gina, Louisiana about a, a year after the Katrina disaster to protest against what was essentially a high school fist fight and conflict that unfolded over the course of a few weeks um, where black and white students got into arguments, whites did intimidating and racist things, blacks retaliated and kicked their asses like they should have, and then 
they paid a stiff punishment for it in terms of school discipline and, and the local law enforcement. Um, thousands of people, maybe some of you in this audience, went to Gina, Louisiana to protest against what was, against what was happening to those young uh, teenagers at that high school. Why was there no comparable demonstration, national mobilization for the, the residents of public housing in the city of New Orleans? We need to ask ourselves that. Why didn't we see the same outpouring of outrage, knowing that, that the city was poised to demolish um, the big four, right? The, the big four plus the Iberville, right? The last remaining public housing complexes, which all tended to stand on relatively valuable real estate, particularly the Iberville and the Lafitte, which were right adjacent to the downtown tourist core. Why didn't we see that kind of protest? Why didn't people get as upset about um, that pending demolition as they did about a small, sort of small scale racist incident in another part of Louisiana that nobody even knew about until it made the news? This is a problem. What we saw post Katrina was an orchestrated attempt to rid the city of its poor, to um, remove the city of whatever opposition might stop uh, the kinds of designs that the uh, investor class had in mind for the remaking of the city. And it was, it was methodical, right? I mean, in a short order, Ray Nagin, as well as um, you know, various real estate interests succeeded in firing um, public sector workers en masse in short order. Uh, in a few months, they were able to dissolve the city's public school system, effectively firing thousands more public school teachers, most of them African-American women. They were able to shut down um, the charity hospital, which had provided you know, health care to thousands of New Orleanians for generations. And they were also able to demolish those last five, you know, the big four plus one, mm -hmm. last five uh, public housing complexes. So once you get rid of those constituencies, right, public housing tenants who were active and had actually stopped some attempts to demolish public housing beforehand, public sector workers, unionized teachers, as well as nurses and doctors who were committed to uh, working with working class populations, who's left to fight for a different city? So it's no wonder that, it, that quickly you saw the wholesale remaking of the city the displacement of the poor, um, the fact that only about, a, uh, you know, you saw like about 100,000 blacks had not returned to the city within the first five years of the disaster. Um, that's changed a little bit, but many people who've moved back can't live in New Orleans anymore, right? They have to live on the outskirts, right? So in effect, we've seen, um, you know, a suburbanization of the, the black population in ways that were that, um, or orchestrated, right? They weren't accidental. And, and I think we need to be a lot, a lot clearer about what we want, and we need to be clear about fighting for it, right? There was no reason why we shouldn't have fought, not just to save public housing, but to make it better, right? I mean, it was always doomed to fail. It was always hamstrung from the very beginning. But there's, there's ways that we could have moved differently. The last thing I'll say, I don't, I don't know how I'm looking on time. Do we have a timekeeper at all? Or oh, this is just free flowing. All right. Um, so, the last thing I'll say is that a lot of us did participate in the remaking of New Orleans in the sense of uh, going to the city as volunteers, right? So within the first five years, about a million people cycled through the city to do uh, volunteer work, right? Um, so college students, church groups, you know, different organizations from across the country, even some of the most uh, ostensibly left groups engaged in a lot of volunteer labor, right? Recruiting volunteers to come down to do uh, rebuilding. I don't want to knock that, right? Because I participated in it as well. It was one of the ways that I was able to get to the city um, when I was living in an isolated part of western New York without a research budget at a small liberal arts college. So pulling together a group of students and going down was one way that I was able to get down there and start doing the work that I was interested in doing. Um, but it was in that process of being in the city amidst those thousands of volunteers that you got a sense of how um, the entire context was depoliticized. So volunteers could show up, you know, um, engage in painting of houses or stripping houses down to, you know, the studs, clearing out debris, um, you know, all sorts of tasks. 
And you deal with really grateful homeowners, right? These people are really happy. They're like in their worst moment. They're still in shock. And it's mutually beneficial, right? For the, the bleeding hearts who go down, it's great because you get to have this story that you can write about in your graduate you know, essay or whatever. <laughs> Um, or you can write about it and talk about it on panels like, like I'm doing here. Um, but for people who were there, it had a number of different um, and really bad consequences that I just want to mention. Uh, and, and in a way, it supported this sort of privatized recovery that had been set in motion by the capitalist class in New Orleans, but also beyond. So one thing that volunteers labor does in the immediate sense is it drives down wage floors for paid laborers. So you would have on the same street in some parts of New Orleans within those first, that first decade or so, you would have on, on one side of the street a busload of students who have Tyvek suits. They have uh, water supplies. They have gloves. They have goggles. All the things they need to do this dangerous and potentially you know, harmful work. On the other side of the street, you would see you know, a black contract worker with no supplies, right, with no supports, being paid piecemeal for whatever he's doing by the day, under the table. You also had, you know, and there's a number of people who've written about this, um, undocumented workers who were uh, overworked, who were underpaid, in some cases not paid at all, who were threatened at gunpoint in some incidents that have been reported. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those volunteers were existing within a highly unjust context and in part supporting right, that unjust context. I'll give you one illustration of this, how you can be a volunteer, you can do good, but at the same time you can actually support a great level of injustice. The first trip that I took down with a group of students, we, um, we spent some time in a place called St. Bernard Parish, which is one of the suburban parishes, parishes county, right, for people who are not from Louisiana, right, not church parish. Um, so St. Bernard is adjacent to Orleans Parish, so it's basically the suburbs. And um, it had a bad reputation when I was a teenager. I grew up in Louisiana, but not in New Orleans. St. Bernard Parish is one of those places older black people told you not to go, right, because you, uh, you know, it's just not the place you want to be, even though there were small populations of blacks in St. Bernard. So we were working in St. Bernard Parish um, the first time that I went down there, which was a, a source of contention for me and the person who organized the trip. But as we're working, talking to residents, you know, trying to get a sense of what's happening, this is in October of 2006, um, you know, less than, a little bit more than a year after the, the disaster. St. Bernard Parish had passed a, um, a blood relative ordinance. Right, which basically said that you couldn't rent to anybody in St. Bernard Parish unless they were your blood relative. And so, you know, while, while we're there, I'm already uneasy about being there. But once we, we talk to, uh, you know, Bill Quigley, one of the local activists, and he tells us about what's going on there, you know, it was, it was shocking, and it ended up being, you know, a, a revelation. It's like, you can go down and do good, but if you don't engage in the political struggles that are happening, Right? What good are you in that kind of context? Mm -hmm. And so we were there helping people as individuals, even as they're being racist and exclusionary to other folks who are trying to rebuild the area, people who are looking for housing in uh, a devastated region where housing is in, in, in a shortage. And so it's quite possible with this whole volunteer you know, style of, of rebuilding for you to do good and do harm all at the same time. Mm -hmm. We need to be mindful of that. And I think a lot of activism, and there's a, there's a book by uh, Rebecca Solnit called A Paradise Built in Hell, where she sort of celebrates this sort of post-disaster spontaneity, the kind of um, anarchistic response, which is like, you know, fuck the state, we're going to do our own thing, we're not going to worry about government. And there was a lot of that sensibility post-Katrina New Orleans. People had reason to distrust government. They had reason to believe that nobody was going to help them. But at the same time, there was a need to fight for... Um, real policy, like saving public housing, right, mm -hmm. which would have given people the material basis to return for thousands of New Orleanians, right? right. So I think we have, to, we have to push ourselves, right? You know, we have to push ourselves beyond those immediate and easy frames um, of, you know, this is all about racism, essentially. 
into a, a more complex sense of what was happening because on the one side, and this is my last point, I promise. On the one side, you had um, a black governing regime which had led that city since I was like in maybe first grade, right? So you always had black mayor, black majority city council since the, around 1977, 78. On the one side, supporting a lot of the things that I've been talking about, right? Supporting the demolition of public housing, right? The first, the first uh, memo that was circulated, the Rosham Report in 1988, which called for drastically reducing the size of public housing in the city of New Orleans and moving towards a market model mm -hmm. was authored by a black man, Raynard Rochon, who later went on to become a, an assistant to Wilson Good in Philadelphia. Ray Nagin, members of the, of the um, city council, voted to, to move forward with the plan for demolition. And we have to be clear about that, right? We can't just rely on these simplistic narratives to understand what's happening if we really mm -hmm. want to oppose what's, go what's, what's going on and, and pose a different kind of alternative, right? Mm -hmm. I think it was difficult in retrospect to do something else in New Orleans because of that clearing of all of the opposition. In other cities, I think we have more of a chance mm -hmm. because you have people organizing around housing. You have um, progressive unions in place. You have public sector workers who know what neoliberalization is about and are willing to fight back. Right. So I think we have to look for that potential and we have to build around it. But I'll stop right there so everybody else can have a chance to talk. Thank you all. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for that, Cedric. So everybody's going to have the opportunity to ask uh, questions once our other two uh, council members have had the opportunity to speak. We're going to use, when we're taking questions, something that um, my comrades in the Seattle DSA use called progressive stack. So if you are an able-bodied white male who is used to having your voice heard at forums such as this, I think this is a great opportunity to have a seat and listen to folks who might not have had the opportunity to step forward um, at other hearings. Um, and with that said, that's a fancy way of saying you're gonna go last, uh, Sam. And uh, Mimi, we're gonna hear from you next. All right, I like the stack. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I wanna begin um, by, I know that Philip already uh, made a land acknowledgement but given that we're talking about displacement and the right to dwell and who comes and takes places and who gets pushed out of places, and as a visitor here, I also want to acknowledge the land on which we stand today as the traditional home of the Coast Salish people, the traditional home of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Squamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. I thank the original caretakers of this land those who are still here and those who will be here in the future. And I want to say that not just to give um, you know, lip service to this notion of land acknowledgement, but because it's crucial to what I want to talk about, which is to do with mobility justice. And right now, our cities are faced with this um, issue of elites seeking to preserve the status quo and continue urban growth despite a whole series of uh, crises and a sense that we need some kind of um, transition in our forms of urbanization, and especially the idea of sustainable urbanism and ecological urbanism. And I want to talk about how that's implemented in our cities because many North American cities have policies that are promoting various kinds of sustainability and sustainable mobility in particular. And they've become associated with gentrification and displacement um, of African American communities, of immigrant communities, and of working class white communities. And I believe that this has fostered a political mobilization in some cities against ideas about sustainable urbanism. And while our subject today is the neoliberal city, I wanna think about how the sustainability transition in our North American cities needs to be understood within the historical context that was built on the spatial and racial formations based in white colonial settler societies and racial capitalism.
because our neoliberal urbanization is still based on those traditions of displacement and taking people's land and uh, urban regeneration, urban growth that's decimated many communities. So by locating sustainable mobility transitions within that deeper historical context, I think we can better understand why there's so much resistance against seemingly common sense policies such as uh, building protected bike lanes or walkable pedestrian zones, um, transit-oriented development. Each of those things have generated intense political conflict. Um, on the one hand, we have advocates for car culture, what I call the system of automobility, who resist any efforts to constrain or reduce the use of cars. And partly those are suburban and rural constituencies who've used state level electoral politics to keep gas taxes extremely low and to keep investment in roads and highways very high. But there are also many urban minority communities who distrust cycling advocacy and other kinds of uh, uh, urban improvement pro projects who have used city level and neighborhood, including city council electoral politics, to challenge urban uh, improvements because they're so associated with processes of displacement. So I'm going to suggest that American cities will not achieve a reduction in car use and a transition towards more sustainable urban mobility unless we recognize and directly address the racial, class, and colonial histories of uneven mobilities that have formed our racially segregated cities and our automobile dependent suburbs. So I'm, I'm just going to draw a little bit on some of the arguments in my book, Mobility Justice, the Politics of Movement in an Age of Extremes. And I'm going to say a few words here just to highlight the historical dimensions of what I call kinopolitical struggle. That's the struggle over movement, kinopolitics as uh, how we move, um, who has power and control over movement. And those kinopolitical struggles are at the basis of North American white settler societies that are founded on slavery, racial capitalism, theft of indigenous lands, displacement of Native Americans and Mexicans, labor exploitation of Latinx and Asian immigrants. So whether we're dealing with the freedom to move or the right to stay in place, which are closely intertwined, race, gender, and class have been crucial to the uneven distribution of what I call mobility power. And by mobility power, I referred not just to the capability for movement in, in all of the various potentials and the ways in which we move, but also the self-determination of when, where, how, and whether or not we are mobile. So the neoliberal city is um, part of this system of kinopolitical power, which is who determines who gets to move and how they move. And we see struggles over movement um, and dwelling, right, and staying in place happening all the time. I just arrived in Seattle. I haven't been here that many times. And just coming into the city, um, I w saw so many um, encampments of people living under tarps. Um, and I, uh, I think I'm, I didn't see that in the same way the last time I was here, which was quite a while back, but it's a, a very visible issue, obviously, in the city. And I understand that there are efforts that are made to sort of clear people, to push them out, um, fights over where people can, can set up those uh, dwellings and where they're not allowed to. And I even saw people um, sleeping under large trees, right? Like just in the middle of the day, you know, those beautiful big pine trees become a place of shelter and sleep. So um, that's linked obviously to real estate, but it's also linked to mobility and the way in which cars and the dominance of cars and of roadways have determined the shape of our cities in a way that's linked to white power. And I know Cedric was saying we shouldn't blame everything on white supremacy, but certainly the histories of white supremacy have made the spatial forms of our cities as they are today. So by uncovering the, race, the relationship between these historically racialized spatial patterns and mobility inequities, I think we are better placed to understand the kind of fault lines in the contemporary neoliberal city. Um, 
And what I, what I kind of argue for in the book is the need to recover the concept of a mobile commons uh, or of commoning mobility. And that is the notion that there are um, forms of thinking about and organizing mobility that draw on the logics of commoning, such as communal decision-making practices, openness to new forms of perceiving the right to mobility as a collective right, as well as the right to dwell, the right not to be displaced. Also the awareness of the social production of mobility and the power relations inherent in it, as well as the commitment to creating equity and working in the interest of the public good. All of those are part of the idea of commoning mobility. And until we sort of more uh, deeply understand the way in which we have lost the mobile commons, we have lost our right to be, to dwell, and to move through public space, we won't be able to take back our cities. So we need to build the alliances across uh, indigenous, black, people of color, working class, women, gender and sexual minorities to understand the, the control over mobilities that creates those divisions in the first place and that creates a kind of disempowerment of those who are not able to be in public space, to gather, or to assemble, to um, move together safely. And that has to be the, the, the basis for forming the kinds of political communities that can take back the neoliberal city. Um, so I think I'll just stop there for my opening awesome. statement. Thanks so much, Mimi. <laughs> well, uh, it definitely comes as a great shock to uh, many members of the audience here in Seattle to hear that people in other cities actually um, push back against things like bike lanes. That's not uh, an issue that we have here in Seattle. Insert laugh Philadelphia. Track. Don't bring our bike lanes to Philadelphia. Right. You'll get killed. Um, <laughs> Sam, you want to talk about uh, gentrification? Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks to my panelists. Um, yeah, I, I want to build on what Mimi and Cedric were both talking about and um, get to the question of housing and question of real estate and why it's just getting so incredibly expensive um, to live nearly anywhere. So this is a, an urban crisis that is clearly affecting Seattle, uh, but it's not affecting Seattle alone. I'm coming from New York City, where we have a severe affordability crisis, record homelessness. Um, I was just in LA, many of the same problems are there. I was in Philadelphia after that, and they're experiencing many of the same things. Um, so this is a, a bigger problem than any one particular city. It's a bigger problem than this country. And there's a lot of ways to explain it. Um, and a lot of the, the dominant explanations have to do with a mismatch between supply and demand, which is a real thing, and I'll get to that a little later. But I want to focus on a different factor, which is not, not just a shortage of supply, but a surplus of finance capital invested into real estate. We're living in a moment right now where a majority of the world's capital is invested in real estate and 75% of it is in housing. So it's not just land, which could be agricultural land or other things, it's specifically urban housing. It's $217 trillion, which is pretty much an unfathomable amount of money. Um, the way that uh, has been described to me and I'll describe to you to, to think about it is all the gold that's ever been mined anywhere in history, all pooled together times 36 is the amount of capital that's invested in global real estate. And as I said, most of that is housing and most of that housing is urban. So why do we have an affordability crisis in our cities? We have a huge amount of money riding on it. And we can think about why there's so much money invested in real estate. It has to do with falling rates of profit in other industries. It has to do with financial deregulation. It has to do with global wealth polarization where a relatively small number of people are looking for something safe to put their money in, perhaps in a different place than they live in now to spread it around. And you get a situation where a ton of money goes into what seems like the safest and fastest reproducing commodity, which right now is urban land. So um, yes, there are issues of supply and demand. Yes, there are demographic changes. Yes, there is generational change, but we can't get around this question of an over-accumulation of finance capital 
in urban land and real estate if we expect to be able to do anything about it. So that turns our cities into not just places where we live and work, not just our communities, our social relations, but it turns them into investments, and investments for a specific class. Um, and some of that is distributed actually fairly widely. If you think about pension funds, um, if you think about people whose only asset is their home, that's, that's a wider distribution. But huge amounts of it are predatory equity funds that are buying up um, housing for the sole purpose of speculating on it and flipping it. We have the world's largest landlord right now is Blackstone, global private equity firm um, that was already quite large in 2008, but really exploded buying up um, foreclosed properties from subprime mortgages all over the US and all over the world. So those are the conditions in which each city is trying to solve this problem. And each city kind of can't do it on its own, um, but is in some ways forced to for a lot of reasons. But one way to think about it is this double bind that cities are in. On the one hand, um, we've seen devolution as a key part of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism being the project um, that Cedric especially described since the 1970s, um, capitalism without resistance, as you, you talked about it. Um, one of the manifestations of this politically has been devolution of responsibility from higher levels of government to lower levels of government, from federal to state and from state to city. There's less and less money coming in from the larger pools of money available at those larger government scales to pay for things at the urban level. And one of the most, uh, mo one of the, one of the most deeply felt manifestations of that is public housing, which was really supposed to be supported by the federal government. Um, the federal government stopped producing affordable housing in the early 70s and really stopped paying for it uh, starting in the 80s. Continuing into the 90s under Clinton, we had Hope 6, which incentivized the demolition of public housing. And under Obama, we got the RAD program, which is a different way of privatizing uh, the buildings, if not the land on which public housing sits. And so we've seen um, cities then having to respond to this crisis. But at the same time as the responsibility is devolved, um, power and control is centralized. It's centralized within cities and in mayors and um, city council leaders who seem to be able to control the entire agenda, but much more so it's centralized at higher levels of government. The state puts limits on what cities can do, the federal government puts limits on what states can do. So cities are more and more responsible for fixing this project, this problem, and yet they have fewer and fewer tools to do it. I mean, what are the two best things that you can do to address gentrification and unaffordability? Public housing and rent control. The federal government put a moratorium on the construction of new public housing under Nixon. Under the Clinton administration, we had the Faircloth Amendment, which said if uh, public housing authorities have a net increase in units, the federal government won't pay for them. Rent control. Um, in a lot of states, as I understand it, Washington state included, the state has put uh, limits on what the municipalities can do in terms of rent control. So. Uh, Cities might want to expand rent control to, to freeze rents, to put a cap on rent increases, and the states are telling them they can't. So then what's left? What's left is land use and um, control over what kind of development happens where. And that becomes, in some ways, the single tool that many city planners, many city leaders, mayors, council members, see as the way to get everything else, as the way to get uh, a grip on the housing question, but also all sorts of other things. If they want uh, investment in parks and schools, if they want uh, increased transit access, a lot of it ends up coming through land use changes, incentivizing development in a particular place and then using the money that comes in for that for some other use. But the thing is when cities incentivize that kind of development, they also create windfall profits and they create them for whoever owns the land. If you uh, increase the development capacity from you know, three stories to 30 stories, you have just multiplied the, the land's value by 10. And who keeps that is the, it's the owner of the property who will in all likelihood tear down what's there and re either do it themselves or get a developer, sell it to a developer to build something bigger. Um, bigger is fine, I have no problem with larger size, but uh, once that value has been created, the land becomes quite expensive.
And then what gets built there, again, because of that surplus of finance capital that's now in urban land, tends to be luxury real estate, unless there's something else telling them that they can't do that. And so then, in the pursuit of all sorts of other things, including affordability, we see cities incentivize the production of luxury housing. And in that way, they make the city more expensive in order to make it cheaper. And sometimes this is done um, e exactly for that reason. And conservative or neoliberal politicians have no problem saying that. They say, we are purposefully making our land more valuable in order to uh, increase property values. We're going to build out the luxury city. Um, my former mayor, Michael Bloomberg, called New York a luxury product. And he referred to it as the world's second home as in the place where rich people can, can buy a property. And he loved it. And he, he said, um, we want more oligarchs. When he started to get criticized for this, he said, we want more oligarchs. We want them here. They're going to buy property. They're not going to use our services, and they're going to pay the taxes, which is exactly what the mayor of Providence, Rhode Island, said to me at my uh, Jewish elementary school graduation. He said, I love you people. You pay your taxes and don't use the services. <laughs> you people, he said. So... Um, yeah, that was CNC. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's what Michael Bloomberg said. He said, yeah, we're doing that. That's right. And, and the, the lie of it all is they include with these upzonings also a great deal of tax breaks. And so those rich people don't end up paying their taxes. That's, that's the thing. They don't pay the taxes, and then we don't get the, the money to then use for the services. The whole thing is a lie. So that's the conservative approach, or the um, blatantly neoliberal. But there's a progressive line on this, too, or a liberal line which is um, we're going to create value and then we're going to recapture it. We're going to make this land more expensive. We're going to allow developers to build up the neighborhoods, but then we're going to demand something back for them. They're going to have to provide some degree of affordability or in, in some small proportion of the property, or we're going to get them to, buy, to build the park that the city needs, or we're going to get them to pay into a fund for public schools, etc. But it becomes this trap where nothing can get done unless we produce value for real estate investors. There's no other way to get the affordable housing that's, that's offered. I mean, there are other ways, but they're not being offered. There, there's no other uh, way that's being offered to get the parks that we need and the schools that we need and the transit that we need. And so then we get the situation that uh, Dr. Schiller's talking about, where communities will fight against these things, even though they very much want them. Right? They want parks, they want transit, they want schools, they want everything. But they don't want a luxury development to come in, uh, then pay for those schools, but in so doing, the luxury development has raised the overall neighborhood land values, which results in higher property values, which re results in higher rents, if you don't have a rent control system to, to keep a cap on all these things. And so then you, you basically can't get to enjoy the thing that you wanted, and the thing that you suffered through many generations of not having. So this is, this is a paradox, um, and the, the presentation that you know, we often get is um, either it's great, what are you complaining about, or <laughs> it's bad, but what else are we going to do? So we have to think about how we can oppose real estate capital, how we can squeeze real estate capital, rather than um, encourage it and try to get something back from that. Because any time we do that, we're going to produce a city that we can't afford to live in and ultimately won't get to enjoy the benefits of the things that we're funding. So, um, you know, the, the dominant model is the trickle-down model. Build a lot of luxury housing and then uh, either ask them to build some affordable housing along with it or then rich people will move into that housing, middle-class housing will become available, the poor will move into there. Um, that kind of filtering does not tend to happen. It certainly doesn't happen fast, and it doesn't happen in uh, many of the gentrifying areas of the cities. And so that's not the answer. Um, then, but if that's not the answer, then the other alternative that's usually presented is do nothing, which is freeze everything. And that's kind of like a hardcore preservationist argument. Um, both of these, I would argue, uh, and, and these two things come to be coded as NIMBY versus YIMBY not in my backyard versus yes in my backyard. The not in my backyard crowd saying, don't build anything, keep everything the way it is, um, which as we know is a terrible system. Yes. Or the Yimby crowd says, build up the city, um, let the developers provide the supply and the benefits will trickle out. We don't really believe in leaving things up to the free market anyway, so why would that be different? 
in the case of housing, and yet that, that argument attracts a lot of followers. I think we should think of both of them as status quo arguments. Um, the YIMBY argument sounds like it's not a status quo argument because it's saying, you know, we need to get rid of these zoning regulations and other things so we can encourage luxury development. But that's what's happening in cities all over the country and all over the world. That's the mainstream form of urban planning, of development. Um, that's what the, the neoclassical economists are arguing for. So that, in a lot of ways, is the status quo. But so is the NIMBY, right? The, the leave everything the way it is and protect exactly what we have is also entrenching the status quo. So if we're Marxists, if we're radicals, we need to be thinking of other ways uh, to do things than getting ourselves trapped in that uh, fight over two versions of the status quo, both of which completely fail the working class. So the problem is not just an inadequate supply of housing overall. The problem is there is not enough housing that's affordable to the people who need housing. So building up luxury housing is not going to uh, solve that problem, especially because we have this crisis of overaccumulation. And I want to use my home city, New York, as a cautionary tale here. New York, over the last three years, built up more housing than uh, would be demanded by the number of people who moved into the city. Right? So we kept up with pace. We built out beyond the pace of growth, in fact. But at the same time, so we added 70,000 units of housing between 2014 and 2017. In that same period, an additional over 60,000 units went vacant. And they didn't go vacant because there wasn't a market for them. They went vacant because there was a market for vacant housing. For housing that could be purchased, not for the use, um, but for the purpose of holding on to, storing your cash in, and then selling for more money or possibly putting it on Airbnb, or possibly staying for a couple weekends when you're visiting from Paris or wherever you live. But if you just build out luxury housing, and you don't do anything about speculation, you just create new safety deposit boxes for wealthy people, that in the process makes everybody else's housing more expensive. So we have to actually attack speculation. We have to be using our tax code, uh, yes to tax the rich, to create new revenue, which we can use for affordable housing, but also uh, to attack the practice of buying property for the purpose of selling it for more. Um, and we can do that with flip taxes, we can do that with warehousing taxes, we can do that in, in many different ways. We need to be adding to the stock of public land and public housing rather than seeing public land as this sort of chip that the city has to encourage new development, which is what it is in many places and as I understand it is common practice in Seattle as well. We need to be holding on to public land and using it for public use. But we can also be expanding the stock of public land in a few different ways. Um, one way of thinking about this is tax foreclosure. The process of uh, taking people's property when they don't pay their taxes. That's common practice in cities all over the country. Often they're then uh, taken by the city and then immediately offloaded. And in New York City, we put a lien on the properties, we bundle those liens together, and then we sell them off to a speculator who now has a lien on multiple uh, homes, which are largely working class families whose incomes just weren't keeping pace with the value of their properties. And so it's just dispossession on dispossession. So what we've been saying in New York is turn every foreclosed property into a community land trust. As soon as the state takes possession of it, they have the ability to do this. We have legislation that's languishing in the city council that would make this legal. You would then have a large stock of permanently affordable housing. And it's not by building new housing, though we should also be doing that. It's by making permanently affordable that which would otherwise go to speculators. The city of Paris, which is not exactly a paragon of radicalism, has a program over the last few years called the city's right to buy. So in, a, in certain geographical areas, any time a housing unit, whether it's a home or an apartment, goes up for sale, the city has the first right of refusal. They can buy it and they can turn it into public housing. We could be doing that. Washington DC has the, the TOPA Act, Tenant Opportunity, Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, which says tenants in any multifamily building have the right to buy their property whenever it goes on sale, before anybody else. So the tenants can buy it out. And the city will give them um, a whole bunch of subsidy and tax breaks if they make it a limited equity co-op, meaning a home that can't be sold for anything more than you bought it for. 
So it becomes basically decommodified, even though it's still privately held. Right? These things exist. We should be building on that. We should be dreaming up more. Um, but we certainly can't just keep giving real estate capital more opportunities um, to turn our cities into investment products because it's just not going to trickle down to us. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for that, Sam. So while we're talking about um, the city as a speculative real estate investment, um, I wanted to point out that we are actually joined here tonight by 2017 mayoral candidate Carrie Moon, uh, who proposed the idea of a real estate, um, a real estate speculation tax, um, which we should absolutely implement and support candidates who propose implementing it. Um, so are we? Uh, we're going to turn it over to questions. Now, if anybody has any questions they would like to ask of our four or three uh, city council members. Not all at once. Do you have a question? They should use the mic. Oh, here yeah, we go. Real quick. Hello, I'm Shane from Town Hall. Uh, we are doing an audio recording of this event this evening. So if you do have a question, if you wouldn't mind coming up here, both so that everybody can hear you and so we're able to capture your question. Um, so feel free to step on up and ask a question. I guess while we're, while we're waiting for folks to uh, step up and ask, I just personally have a question about what the um, resistance has looked like to any number of um, urbanist or equitable or inclusive reforms that people have tried to put forward in the various cities that you uh, represent. Uh, some of us here are very, very familiar with what that resistance may or may not look like um, in Seattle. Um, and it largely takes the shape of a largely white political block going to city council where there's a giant dial with Chief Seattle's face on it and them saying that they don't want anybody else to move here. Um, but I understand that New York might be different, New Orleans might be different, other cities might be different. So I'm curious about whether or not the fight that we're sort of fighting here in Seattle, um, you know, to sort of pave a right to the city for everyday people looks, do we have similar enemies, I guess, is what I'm asking straightforwardly. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just comment a little bit about Philadelphia. And um, I mean, we, we have a 26% of the population live below the poverty line in Philadelphia. And we have one of the highest uh, wealth and income gaps in, in the country. Uh, Atlanta, Miami, and Philadelphia are the three highest and are comparable to the country of Columbia. And, and so we've had growth in wealth, uh, poverty stuck, and a shrinking of the middle class. Um, we don't have the kinds of quite the crazy real estate prices that New York or Seattle or Vancouver um, experience, but certainly um, huge amounts of uh, development happening in central neighborhoods of the city that are gradually kind of spreading. and driving up prices. So we're, we're just on the cusp of this huge crisis. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, we have um, 40,000 empty lots um, and um, various ways in which um, I think some of the policies that Sam suggested would be, could be perfect to be taken up in Philadelphia because we still have homeowners and renters who might be able to afford to hold on to their homes if some of those policies were in place. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I'll give two examples. So one from New Orleans and then one from Chicago. Um, the New Orleans side is obviously not as, as rosy. Um, there's been a lot of organizing around um, vacation rentals and you know attempts to try to change that and place restrictions on it because uh, in some neighborhoods, you can imagine, um, some owners have moved towards no longer offering that as a, a rental to a family, but are totally using it as a vacation, you know, short-term rental um, through Airbnb or HomeAway and other, other services. So that's been a real problem there. And I think in a lot of destination cities, that's been a major issue. It's been tough to try to fight it because, you know, now these, these different uh, providers are, are organizing as well. And, and oftentimes they've actually written some of the law, or helped to write the laws, the, you know, the new policies that come into into being, so that's a problem in, in, in New Orleans. Uh, on a more optimistic note, in, in Illinois, we were able to uh, remove that state restriction on 
uh, rent controls, right? So now the city of Chicago could possibly move in that direction. And I think, I think people are pushing for all of the things that, that Sam mentioned, right, you know, in a place like, like Chicago. So they're pushing for um, different ways of decommodifying housing, whether it's, um, you know, more public housing, if that's, if that's a possibility, uh, community land trusts, also cooperatives, and then rent control, sort of a, um, you know, a combination of different things that are happening, you know, mm -hmm. we hope to happen all at the same time or mm -hmm. in succession, so. And the, the portrait in Chicago is especially rosy because you all just elected like eight DSA members to the Aldermanic it's Council, less, less something that. like yeah. that. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's less than that. Yeah. Um, but it is, it is in, in encouraging, right, to see awesome. that. Awesome. Um, in the New York context, I mean, I'm not even sure I recognize the, the dynamic of the question because we haven't had movements to do the right thing that then wealthy groups would fight against. <laughs> so, so, you know, what we've had even, so let's, let's talk about future president Bill de Blasio. We've had, the <laughs> it's gonna happen. Um, he, he's had this so-called progressive housing and zoning agenda, uh, which is upzoning neighborhoods and then demanding that some of it be affordable, but he's only done it in working class, majority people of color neighborhoods mm -hmm. that are already affordable or at, are at risk of gentrification, and his program accelerates that. And so, yeah, there was a lot of fight back, but it wasn't coming from the wealthy, predominantly white, low-rise neighborhoods, which do exist in New York. It's just no one is threatening them with anything. Mm -hmm. They have been protected. Uh, there was protected already, they were re-protected under the Bloomberg administration and de Blasio is doing nothing to undo those protections. And so they're kind of sitting quiet. Um, they have what they need from the city, they're not asking for change. Uh, they let, you know, other communities fight alongside, you know, fight, fight for their own uh, neighborhoods, but they're not getting involved. So what we see is really the, the real estate industry as the real estate industry, um, either supporting some of these projects or fighting back against the movement to expand rent stabilization and rent control in New York, mm -hmm. and then setting up phony tenant organizations. <laughs> so that's the new manifestation, is we already had sort of sell out nonprofits, but now we have actually fake real estate fronts that are called like tenors and Tenants and Owners United or something like that, <laughs> that is saying like, um, <coughs> we're, we're tenants and we love our small landlord and they shouldn't be punished with these restrictions on how much they can raise the rents. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, first question. Years, three years it's been in place? It's been two or three years in Vancouver. I mean, everyone in Vancouver that I know supports that, but wishes that they did it 15, 20 years ago. You know, it, it's late now. There's not so much vacant property, or well, there's vacant internal property. There's not much undeveloped property. Um, I don't know the answer to the question of whether it's moving to Toronto. I don't know if anybody else has that, but it mm -hmm. brings up the problem of municipality by municipality creating uh, potential solutions in the face of mobile capital. Mm -hmm. And this is part of how we got to the dynamic that we're in is with capital mobile, even in something like real estate, which is like the most sunk in land in place thing that you can imagine, it's still mobile. You, pla places can be disinvested from and, and investment can move somewhere else, especially if it's for pure speculation. And so we do need a larger scale than the municipal to deal with a lot of these problems. Um, this is, again, the problem of neoliberalism where every responsibility is pushed down to the local level, then every locality has to sort of fight for itself. Um, of course, I'm coming from New York where Amazon tried to move to from here, and we saw the, the horrendous spectacle of Amazon shopping around every city against one another. Uh, and the politicians who supported it in, in New York said, of course this is bad, but what were we going to do, not participate? And so we need, you know, a higher level of political activity on our side in order to fa force a higher level of political action to prevent this sort of shopping around of city against city or else, yeah, we'll have one city that does all the right thing and then they'll lose all their investment and it'll be a capital strike and the people will be punished for their own uh, radical action. Anybody want to add to that? Um, I, I, just to add one thing which is uh, to do with Airbnb. Um, which is that you know cities are trying to come up with policies to control the you know the amount of days you can rent a place out or how many you can uh, um, hold, but everybody's each city is sort of catching up as as it sort of takes so much real estate away. But that 
I just want to mention that while some people are using Airbnb in a kind of business entrepreneurial way, there's others who are e extremely precarious in their housing and are relying on it to even be able to live where they're living. So they're kind of like, you know, lift drivers and, and you know, kind of just trying to hold on to a, a little piece of real estate, not one that's driving down the road, but one that's sitting still um, by having people just sort of coming through it all the time. And it's like more and more urban dwellers are being pushed into that precarity of housing. And I think in a lot of ways what you say is um, Mimi reminiscent of what goes on with um, contests around upzoning in Seattle where we have seen a significant amount of that happening mostly in South Seattle at first as far as there being a lot of new real estate development there that's displaced a lot of people of color. Um, but that the fights around this have started to get increasingly vocal as the attention has turned to putting some more of that housing in areas that traditionally haven't um, had to absorb new development or certainly not affordable development or definitely not public development um, at all. Uh, next question. Hi there. Um, as, a, as a local Seattleite, I've seen this city really change in its composition, um, you know, increasingly rapidly, but I wonder um, if our panel members could comment on the way that we can make this fight more regional, uh, specifically as we see the suburbanization of, and gentrification of communities of color, of working class communities, of immigrant communities who settle, um, you know, like in our logistics hub in the Kent Valley that's directly to the south of, of Seattle. Um, in, in perhaps in addition to the fight for rent control, which seems really so so big and sometimes not all that achievable when you're in the grind of, of trying to organize and make this happen. So I wonder um, how, how we might become more regional um, in, in this fight and um, you know, specifically what tactics we might employ. Um, yeah, I don't, so I don't know if this is an answer to that, but just to say that um, it's crucial to understand the relationship between real estate and transportation, right, and mobility, and that p as people get priced out of city centers, they live in more and more distant places, have less and less um, access to transportation links, and more and more automobile dependency, which is expensive, um, and so you end up sort of bringing down your housing costs, but bringing up your transportation costs. And the places that have good density and transportation end up being where the wealthy, what I call the kinetic elite live um, and can get to the airport and fly around the world too. Um, so there's a spatial and regional and housing planning needs to extend, as you say, like beyond just the issue of the city. Um, and to really look at these connections to the um, suburbanization of poverty. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, I just want to. So, regionalism is really important, and and I think it's it's a way out of this city by city trap, uh, and it's important in also you know recognizing that everything is already regional except our planning. Like, our lives are regional, we, we move in and out of cities, people are displaced to the suburbs or exurbs and then commute in long distances. Um, capital is certainly operating at a regional scale and taking advantage of the fact that people are displaced to other areas and then trying to close those rent gaps. Um, but then we have this city planning that is very isolated around individual cities making their own plans, except a couple of like port authorities and other things. Um, conservatives have historically also liked regionalism. So regionalism has been a demand of the left and the right. On the right, there's this sort of argument that a region should economically specialize and then workers should move to wherever they are best suited. So like, you know, Seattle becomes, or the, the Seattle area becomes the tech region. And if you're a good tech worker, you'll move to this region. And if you're displaced, then you'll find the region that does your kind of job. And of course, that's an absurd way to, to live. <laughs> and the, the left version of regionalism is usually um, finding the ecological balance for any given planning function and um, breaking down the borders that between city and country and the mutual exploitation thereof. So I think the only way to move toward that left version of regionalism is to build our movements at a regional and larger scale. Like if our, our movements are a housing justice city, 
movement in the city of Seattle alone. It's never going to address the regional dynamics. In New York, we're trying something that's probably, I, I don't know how well it's going to work, but we're trying it. It's this upstate, downstate housing alliance. And it's a package of statewide housing bills that address both rural and urban housing issues. And the, the demand is you need to address all of this. And we're not going to allow, you know, this year the urban um, issues to get pri priority and not the rural, and next year the rural and not the urban. We want it all addressed at once. And so if we can build up our, our movements to those regional levels, maybe we'll have a better chance at getting that result. Let me add one more thing to it. I think, um, I mean, one thing we have to think about historically, right, is that the, the problem we're in right now as far as cities grew out of a, um, a particular kind of, of pro-real estate national urban policy, which begins, you know, during the New Deal, but really begins, begins to take shape post-New Deal, New Deal, right, and post-World War II, um, where, whereby many Americans are convinced, you know, that owning a home, right, and, and living in a suburban uh, neighborhood is the American dream, right? I mean, to the extent that, you know, by the time I come around, you know, in the 1970s, it's kind of a given that that's what, what people want to pursue. But that has to be set in motion, and it was supported by national policy and by massive investments of infrastructure and, and, um, and capital. And I think, you know, for, for those of us on the left, we also have to think about a new national urban policy um, one which isn't predicated on the sort of vast uh, misuse of, of resources and vast ecological problems that were created, you know, by that post-war um, transformation, but one which, which tries to reverse some of those problems and one which is focused not so much on um, <coughs> exchange values, as Sam was saying earlier, but on use, use values, right? It should be modeled around what people actually need um, versus this kind of using real estate as a means of, of uh, absorbing, you know, surplus, right? So I think, um, I think we have to think in those terms. Now, we've been on our heels for a long time now, and it's tough to even think, you know, in a place like Chicago where you have in the metro area roughly, uh, you know, a little bit less than 10 million people, um, and then L.A., New York, even larger, right? It's tough to think even in those contexts about having a, a regional policy, but I think we have to move in that direction, right? We have to be able to think in those terms. Uh, it doesn't help us either that we have a national Congress where rural and smaller places are actually overrepresented in Congress, um, as opposed to cities. And so, you know, there's a lot of, of work in front of us, but I mean, I think we have to at least begin the process of thinking about what would a, a progressive left um, socialist urban policy look like in a place like the United States. One uh, last just to tag on top of that, I think it was uh, Malcolm X who said that racism is like a Cadillac in the sense that they roll out a brand new model every year. Um, and in 2019, I think a lot, in a lot of ways what racism looks like is actually needing a Cadillac or some kind of car to be able to access like basic needs, right? Traveling very, very far from work to home um, in suburbs of invisible poverty, places like Federal Way, Burien, Renton, and so as much as we do a lot of focusing, I think, on um, electoral contests and like supposedly cosmopolitan cities like Seattle, the case has often been made, I think, credibly so, that one of the, the sort of underlooked opportunities that we have for change, at least as far as electoral work is concerned, is building coalitions in places like Federal Way and the South End, um, you know, running candidates for state ledge in places like that for city council because there's a mass of disaffected people in those areas who have been displaced precisely because of some of the policies that everybody else has been describing um, that I think would be as eager or as happy to push for the kind of change that we need as, um, you know, so-called progressives in places like Seattle. So, thanks so much. Okay. Um, so I had the, uh, the misfortune earlier this week of attending a candidate forum uh, put on by the organization uh, Speak Out Seattle. They're a, uh, they're a local Nimbius group. Um, yeah. Um, in which I heard the, the somewhat questionable claim that uh, New York has housed 100% of its homeless population. Um, okay. the, the, these are people who want to round up the homeless and put them in internment camps, and they think that the only reason the city council won't do this is that they're held hostage by the, uh, the nonprofit sort of homeless industrial complex. 
Um, so I, my question is, how, how do we understand and push back against this increasingly vicious right-wing response to the housing movements we've been trying to cobble together? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so first I'll, I'll take on the New York specific <laughs> question. So I assume what this group is referring to is that New York City has a right to shelter established. Um, it's basically an interpretation of our, our, our charter from the state um, that was argued in courts in the 1970s and won. So we don't have a right to housing in New York City, but we have a right to shelter, which means that if you um, are homeless, you can go to the city and then first you get vetted to see if there's any place else you can go. If you have any family or friends you can stay with. Um, they will buy you a one-way ticket somewhere else. They might even get you an apartment in Newark, New Jersey, which is uh, not terribly far, without telling the city of Newark, New Jersey that that's what they were doing, and, and house them there. If all of that fails, then you are guaranteed a bed in a shelter. But that's not the same as, you know, permanent housing. Um, on top of that, we still have a lot of people who sleep on the streets or in the subways or elsewhere. So we have 70,000 homeless people counted in New York City. Presumably it's far larger than that, but that's the highest number we've, we've ever had. Um, and the amount has grown under de Blasio by two times as much as he promised to cut it at, by this point. <laughs> so New York is, is, you know, we have the good situation that we have the legal right to shelter, but that does not eliminate homelessness altogether. Does anybody else want to say anything about the second half of the question? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I think my answer is we can't allow homelessness to be considered as separate from the housing movement. That's the way that it gets picked off and dealt with as a separate set of issues. It, it has to be part of the housing movement in the same way that public housing has to also be part of the housing movement and not seen as this other thing that is a problem that has to be fixed on its own. Um, and really, I guess that argument is you have to overwhelm the power of the, what, what did you call them? Uh, uh, the organization called Speak Out Seattle. Speak Out Seattle, right. I mean, we have these groups in New York uh, where we have the right to shelter who show up and protest outside new homeless shelters, and it's horrible. And the things that they say are awful. Um, and, you know, one way that we've challenged that is uh, through homeless organizations that go and join the protest and basically they protest both the people who are protesting and the policy solution that's being offered because it's all terrible. <laughs> and, and that kind of ends up marginalizing the original protesters who showed up because they look bad compared to the others. I don't know. Um, yeah, no, I was just thinking of one thing. If any of you have read um, Matthew Desmond's book, Evicted, um, and it's really um, devastating to, to learn that, you know, the, the people most at risk of losing their homes and ending up homeless or having to stay in shelters are black women with children. And um, I mean, I think it goes back to some of the questions around racial justice in this country. And um, I was at an event last night at my um, university in Philadelphia with Richard Florida, the author of the creative class. Um, and he's now moved on and sort of disavowed the creative class and now recognizes um, this problem and his new mantra is innovation with inclusion. How can we have inclusive innovation? And there's all these white men are kind of sitting there saying, how can we fix innovation so that it's, it'll be more inclusive? <laughs> and and they, the statistics they pull up are that the average wage for service workers in Philadelphia, the annual um, pay is $27,000, the median pay for service work. So it's like, duh, raise people's wages and then maybe black women in particular will be able to pay the rent and hold on to their homes and not end up homeless on the streets. I mean, that's a particular version of it on the East Coast and maybe the situations are, are a little different in, in Seattle in terms of who's in the homeless population. Richard Florida, <laughs> the Taylor Swift of urbanism. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was wondering personally for each of you how the current urgency around climate change has impacted the way that you do your research, that you talk and write about the work that's most passionate to you and how the urgency of climate change lends on top of whatever else it is that motivated you to do what you do has, has impacted you. And then also in general on a larger scale in terms of movements, do you think that the urgency of climate change has contributed 
to some of us, myself included on the left, aligning ourselves with neoliberal thinking and solutions that we wouldn't normally be advocating for if we didn't feel the dual housing and climate emergencies. I'll start it. So, I mean, with the work I've done on, on New Orleans post-Katrina, I mean, those, those issues are already sort of, you know, foregrounded in a huge way. Um, I mean, I'll say something rather cynical, though, right? I don't think, so you remember the book that, that Naomi Klein came out, This Changes Everything, right? The, the, her, her take on, on um, climate change, I think, was also coming out of the urgency of her own mm -hmm. battle with cancer uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. um, she screened that film in uh, Chicago, and she and Avi Lewis, the film that came along with the book, she and Avi Lewis were on hand to talk about the, the, uh, the film afterwards. And I walked out of the, the theater feeling pretty, pretty um, disappointed by it as a film, and I think the general take on climate change, because most of the film focused on uh, the battles over the Dakota Access Pipeline, indigenous people fighting in that particular context with all these other folks who flock to the area to support them. Um, peasants in, in India who are also fighting against, you know, uh, corporate power. And to me, it just felt like more of the same, right? So instead of, I walked away, not so much that this changes everything, but this is just more of the same as far as how the left has operated in terms of how we think about political struggles. Going back to the earlier point I made about the post-war urban transformation, the real problem with the climate crises, right? As far as I'm concerned, it's not the landless peasants. It's not the, the uh, you know, the indigenous folks. It's the people who live in the cities that we've created over the last, you know, 80 years or so. Where we've, again, created tremendous amounts of, of waste and consumption of the world's resources. Not just us, I mean, China is also doing its part to just, you know, destroy the earth even further. So I think that's the problem in my mind, right? It's it's, it's not a new problem, right? It's actually the same contradictions that we've seen before within, within capitalism, right? The, the demands that it places upon living labor, the demands it places upon um, the Earth's resources, uh, all over again, right? And just in a more intense form. And now that certain segments of the population are now awakening to the problem, that it now finally affects them, um, it makes me kind of pissed off a little bit, right? I'm sort of like, you know, there are people who've been dealing with these things for, for decades. Um, and it's, it's only now that it's, it seems like it's achieving a lot of attention and, and focus, which it should. So I'm not saying we shouldn't fight. But I think it just, it, it's a cause for <clears throat> cynicism on my part. And I don't really see where we're making the kinds of deep changes in the society that would be necessary to put a dent in the problems that we've created at this point. I mean, you know, I, I don't, I think again, the power of capital, right? You know, in, in most places and on many issues remains very much as it was before, right? So we can, so even like those protests against a pipeline, right? It, it's so much bigger than that, right? It's, there's so much more that has to happen. And I remember having a conversation with uh, one of my cousins last year about the Trump election, right? I grew up in South Louisiana. Most men in my family work for petrochemical companies. And, you know, one of my cousins told me that he voted for Trump. I was heartbroken. I was outraged by that. But it made total sense, given the context, right, that there's many, you know, whether it's black, white, it doesn't matter, right? Cajun, it didn't matter in South Louisiana from, you know, really from Mobile, Alabama, all the way across to East Texas. There's a, a huge swath of the workforce that is deeply invested in, um, you know, oil and gas drilling. And so there's so much work to be done. I mean, I don't know where we start to reverse the kinds of investments that either my cousin has in the status quo or many of us in the society, people in our families who are not really trying to change the way that we, we live, right? We're not really trying to change the city and change... Um, you know, the society in the fundamental ways that would be necessary to move, mm -hmm. move forward. So I'm actually pretty cynical about, you know, questions of climate change. And I don't know. I, I'll just stop there. <laughs> I'll, just try, I'll just get worse the longer I talk. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll say just briefly. Oh, One uh, housekeeping yeah. item, Mimi, before yeah. you go. So we have a growing uh, line that includes at least one sitting city council member, um, in Lisa Hobold. 
Okay, so I just wanted to ask to make sure that we were good on time, but it seems like uh, the impresario okay. has it covered, so okay. let me take it away. I'll be quick. Just to say, climate change is um, crucial to all the work I do. And um, in fact, I have um, my, my next book that'll be coming out in 2020 is called Island Futures, Caribbean Survival in the Anthropocene, because uh, the Caribbean and Central America are um, especially affected by climate change um, right now and even the capacity to to survive in the future. Um, but with that said, I think it's crucial that we recognize that climate change is not caused by all humanity. It's not humans who have caused it. It is capitalism and a, a group of high consumers of energy and fossil fuels along with the industries that have caused climate change. And until we call them out and make them accountable for it, it's stupid to say like, well, we all need to, you know, drive less and do this or that, turn off the lights, whatever. Uh, because if you took the top 10% in terms of um, wealth uh, accumulation and the amount of energy that they use in their daily lives and just brought them down to the average, you would reduce CO2 emissions by 40%. <laughs> so, you know, let's start with them and not worry about all the little folks, right? And, that, and then on top of that, the, the companies, right? And we all know that this country's government is controlled by the fossil fuel industry. We're di plunging ahead into more fossil fuel development and, um, and, and, and th they're fighting a sort of life and death battle right now. And it's up to us to, that they're gonna kill us and kill every living thing on the planet um, unless we stop them. Um, yeah, I'm really impressed to, um, to hear all of you, put, uh, us putting our heads together uh, from all your big cities that have had the crisis, had to deal with this crisis, and from what you were saying, that they stopped building uh, public housing, I, I believe you said in the, since the late 70s, uh, you know, affordable public housing. What can we do to get uh, us from the whole country together What's stopping us to all get all us big cities and smaller cities together on a national movement to put pressure on the federal government to build affordable public housing and, and deal with all, all these other issues of homelessness too? You know, uh, you know right. do, this, do this on a bigger conference or, or, or whatever. Yeah. It's great. I think, um, you know, one thing it seems to me that is not to be underestimated is the very sustained war, um, both figurative and metaphorical, on leftist ideas that this country has waged um, since really the inception of socialism. Um, and it's kind of a small miracle that there are still actually people the world over, and especially in the United States, for as much capitalistic propaganda as we've been fed in various forms that still identify with the left, so just taking the opportunity to recognize that there is a political alternative, a socialist alternative, if you will, um, to what we have been fed historically, um, and recognizing that that's not to be taken for granted. That's not something that should have been a given because there has been a lot of energy that's been put into making sure that this would not have been the case. Here in Seattle, um, you know, the Seattle Police Department in 1968 put a $25,000 bounty on the head of Aaron Dixon, the former chair of the Seattle Black Panther Party, for doing what? For advocating for a free lunch program and a community health center that still stands in the Central District to this day. So that um, this is where historically great ideas about how it is that we're actually gonna change for the better have come from is people who identify on this sort of um, end of the political spectrum and no amount of co-optation and diluting the ideas that we come up with is going to change that and I think one of the things that's the most encouraging right now is we're actually seeing um, organizers, electeds, politicians who identify as socialists like actually running and winning in ways that make it clear that these are mainstream ideas and that some of the resistance that we've been seeing those are actually the extreme positions right the, one, the ones that we're talking about are actually the sensible ones so so over the decades, um, uh, over my lifetime, it has been 
one story after another of municipalities being gamed against one, one another, and you alluded to that when you talked about Amazon. Um, and it's not that's not the only time that it's happened. You know, our own governor, in reference to Boeing getting these historic tax breaks, said, um, "Have you ever been mugged?" You know, like they act as though they're, oh, they're we're helpless. We can't do anything about this. They're just, you know, what are we supposed to do? They're going to take their business elsewhere. And for you know, for decades, and also you know, more intensely as as I'm an organizer, um, I I. Can't, I can't m get my brain around why is it that we're not just getting together and talking, like, hey, we're not gonna play this game. Is there any movement amongst municipalities to stop being gamed? And if not, why? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, there, there's a popular movement for that. I haven't really seen it at the political level. I mean, the closest thing that I can think of to that at the political level is like the movement to get rid of the electoral college in this state by state. If everyone does it, we, we won't have it anymore thing. Does anybody know what that's called? National popular vote. National popular vote, like a pact or something that, that all these states have entered into where like if enough of them do it, then they'll send their electors to vote for whoever won the popular vote count and then collectively they'll abolish the electoral college even without getting rid of it. We'd need something like that at the, um, but targeted toward um, development incentives, economic development incentives that are corporate based. I don't think we've seen the movement to do that at the political level because the political establishment still benefits from these things. Mm -hmm. It becomes the way that they can sell the tax break that they wanted to give anyway to the corporation. It becomes the, the way that they can um, you know, prove their worth against some other place that they stigmatize as the bad place that did, made the wrong choice. Right? But like, the, I, I'm going to get the details of this wrong, but Cleveland semi-nationalized its, uh, its heating or electric public utilities in the 70s, right? right? And then there was, Kucinich was the mayor, and there was, there was a capital strike against him, and then it became the, the cautionary tale, don't do that, right? Don't, don't do those things or, or capital will leave. So then the, the mayors that don't do that then become the good ones. See, I didn't do that to you like Kucinich did. So as of now, I think most of the political establishment is quite comfortable with this system. We have to make them uncomfortable if they're going to do anything. Right. It's an organizing problem. It's an organizing problem. It's a power problem. Yeah. Anybody? It's uh, also true that um, State Senator Julia Salazar, uh, the recently elected um, New York City DSA member, had um, participated in a, a statewide bill that was going to be a ban on corporate kickbacks, and this was happening um, in the context of Amazon planning on um, locating or relocating there, and I think that that's an official state bill in New York State that has been filed. I'm not sure about the progress of it, but um, that is, you know, that's something. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so maybe we need to have an organization that gets the municipalities together. Yeah. Hey, thanks for letting me ask a question. I'm just looking for a reality check. Council Member Herbold. Thank you. <laughs> I'm looking for a reality check. So um, up until about 2014, official city policy did not recognize that such a thing called displacement exists. A um, couple council members around that time got the city to start doing displacement risk analysis um, based on um, some work that Portland, Oregon had been doing. So. Starting in uh, 2015, we have these maps that um, show what people's lived experiences are, which is that people are being forced out of the city. Um, in our efforts to create places where people can live close to where we work, we've made it possible for people with wealth to live close to where they work, and people who are low income have to move out of the city and live further away from where they work, for the, further away from the city that they're supporting and keeping running. So um, my objective in using these displacement risk analysis is not just to know that it's happening, but to create public policy to address it. So we've recently, just in the last few months, passed um, mandatory housing affordability program. It is an inclusionary zoning program. We have um, upzoned 37 um, uh, urban villages throughout the city. There are definitely pockets of the city that um, are not subject to these up zones. Um, there are, um, but, but the urban villages, the 37 different urban villages, ha all have them. One of the things that I have proposed, I have a bill that would require 
property owners, property developers, to um, if they are developing <coughs> in areas of high displacement risk, and that development would result in the removal of existing housing, that they would have to either do pay a higher mandatory housing affordability fee, their contribution to affordable housing, which is very low um, in our current law, or they would have to replace the existing affordable housing that they're removing. So I'm being told by a lot of folks that that hurts the cause of affordable housing because that is going to reduce the supply overall. So you're going to be tear like uh, there's, a, there's a building in the <coughs> central district, um, a Cadence property, 25 units of naturally affordable housing um, that's home to 25 households. There's a fellow who um, has been living for 40 years in this apartment since he moved to this country from Laos. Uh, families, this building is going to be uh, demolished and replaced with a 75 unit building which will have a mandatory housing affordability requirement of about five units. Uh, my bill would require either a higher payment or replacement of those units. The reason why I'm being told that this is going to hurt the cause of affordable housing is it might result in the developer deciding not to develop there because it won't pencil out for them financially. Am I hurting the cause of affordable housing by promoting legislation like this? Do we get to vote on this bill? <laughs> Can we do that up here? Phil, do we have the power to do that? Okay. Should we vote on it first? Let's have a discussion from the council. All right. Let's do this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I'm not sure why that, the place where that building is, is the place where that kind of legislation makes sense. Right. I mean, that's the first thing. It's like, why, why? There's, there's a planning um, narrative of rationality of upzoning low land value areas in this affordable way because the land values are low, therefore you can buy them for less, and therefore there's less of a burden on the developer for putting affordable units in them. But it ends up being a recipe for displacing everyone who lives in currently affordable housing, replacing it with new units that are usually less affordable and certainly don't go to the same people who lived there before unless there's some sort of a interim program, which almost never happens. So those are not the places where that policy seems to, to make sense. So it might be geographically targeted elsewhere. That's, that's one thing. Um, another is it seems like developers really want to build in Seattle right now, right? There, there's construction cranes everywhere. Um, and so that means that you can ask for more from them than, than you might be able to in a place where uh, they're trying to lure in developers in the first place. And so asking the impossible or the nearly impossible, like almost all of it has to be affordable except for a little bit which will cross subsidy, or sure you can turn your one uh, single family home into a multifamily apartment building but all of it needs to be rent controlled or something like that, uh, seems perfectly viable and tr it's true like nine out of 10 developers won't bite. But there's still like 100 developers that want to do this and so plenty will still build under those stricter conditions. So I, I think you have the opportunity to demand even more, but also not to geographically locate these things in places that are currently affordable and instead target the pockets of exclusivity, politically difficult as that is, um, as the places that can absorb a program like that. I agree. <laughs> Any more discussion before the vote? Shall we vote for Council Member Herbel's bill? I haven't seen the text of the legislation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the text of the legislation. Okay, that's a very Derridian comment. Let's hear from the audience. Raise your hand if you are for this particular bill. Concept. 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 Con I don't know. No, that's, that's, that's flames. Oh, and, and against. But. Well, there seem to be very few against. There are, there's sort of a lukewarm thing. Is, is the, does the lukewarmness come from the fact that developers have the capacity under some of these bills to pay a fee that will go towards housing that will not build, be built in the neighborhood but maybe an hour outside the city so the people will have to commute into their jobs? Is that one of the reservations? <laughs> Uh, all right, building in Laurelhurst. Well, I think, look, I, I have two announcements. First of all, 
I want to thank all our city council members or panelists, whatever you want to call them, <laughs> for an incredibly inspiring discussion that I could have listened to for another two hours. But let's give them first a hand. <laughs> my, my second announcement is I do want to tell you where you can hear them over the weekend. So Cedric Johnson is appearing tomorrow at noon at the Labor Temple in a panel with Theo Rio Francos, Gianpaolo Baiocchi, and Wally Ugudipe is going to moderate. It's called We the People? Question mark. And the purpose of that panel is we know who they are, the 1%, the oligarchy, whatever you want to call them, but who are we? The people, the proletariat, the uncounted, the part of no part, the rest of us, as Jody Dean says. We're going to have a discussion to try to think about who that way is, how it might be constructed. So that's tomorrow at noon at uh, the Seattle Labor Temple. Tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. at Elliott Bay, Sam Stein is going to talk about his book, Capital City, Real, uh, Gentrification in the Real Estate State, and I urge you to buy it. It fits in one pocket. You can take it along. It's not one of those big sort of things, and it's great. Uh, and another great book, which doesn't quite fit in the pocket, but is also absolutely essential to have, is Mimi Scheller's book, Mobility Justice. She is going to talk about that Sunday noon at the, uh, the Northwest Film Forum as part of what we call our Marxathon. Uh, as for Sean Scott, uh, Rather than seeing him, I think the best we all can do is, during the next few months, go down and do some phone calling for him at the headquarters and get him on the city council. Because we need this man there. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, www.redmayseattle.org or Fan the Flames of Red May. Give with your open hearts so we can make Seattle red every May. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Oh, thank you.